Welcome back to the podcast. My name is Bruce. This is Perspectives. This week, we are not going to do a parenting podcast. We just returned from Ukraine. And I thought the best thing to do, maybe even just for my own processing and maybe some of you out there that have been following the events in Ukraine would like an update. It's been um, an interesting week. We took our family. We just returned yesterday. We were there for four or five days in the Carpathian Mountains, beautiful Western Ukraine. It was the first time that our whole family had gone together into Ukraine. We met with our lighthouse community, those that we've been journeying with over the last 15 years in Ukraine, friends, neighbors, and to be together after eight months. We've seen some of the friends that have come to Romania, but as you know, the men are not allowed to leave Ukraine unless they're over the age of, I think it's 60. You're allowed to leave also if you have more than three or three or more children. So this was the first time that husbands and wives and our family and kids and everybody got to be together. So this was a very special time for us to gather. We, we met at a place that we've been to several times as a family and hosted a few retreats at. It's a, a great spot called Billy Sloan. It means white elephant in uh, English. And it's along a river and there are cabins and it's just great. They feed you there and... We were able to do some morning sessions, just meditation, prayer, and then some optional afternoon uh, themes on trauma, as well as some creative things. And then in the evening time, really a highlight for us to gather and share and hear each other's thoughts. And as leaders of Lighthouse over the last few years, we've really enjoyed seeing Ukrainians step up and into their giftedness and lead. And so this was a, an important time for our family and all of our friends to recognize that there are changes, that the reality moving forward is different than that of the past. And so it was important and meaningful. I think the main thing that everybody felt was just the joy of being together again. One of our friends said, that even just for a moment that we can pretend things are the way that they were, um, to just pause as much as the beauty of creation is inspiring. We went for a, a really long hike up into the mountains together. As beautiful as that is, it's really the joy of being together. You really don't know what you have until it's taken from you. And I'm not a news anchor, <laughs> so, uh, but I do enjoy keeping up with what's happening. I, I love history as well as watching history unfold. And so maybe some of you have had a heart for Ukraine, but you're busy with your life. You know, you know, we can't just stop and become absorbed in one particular area of life. If you're living in the U.S. or Europe or Canada, Ukraine may be something that's, you know, meaningful to you and you care that there's suffering and continuing war, but you've got things to do. You've got lives to live and jobs to work at and families to feed. And so this podcast is just, I want to take, take a look over the last two months in particular and just give you a data dump as someone who does stay up with the news and inside Ukraine, as well as just here in Romania among refugees and so maybe you're driving in your car or you are just playing this at home. Uh, I hope that this kind of catches you up. Maybe in the next 15, 20 minutes, I can give you a feel for what's happening in Ukraine. So for the next 15, 20 minutes, I'd like to just give a little bit of a news update and what's happening both militarily and also among the civilian population. There are a lot of things coming down the pipe right now for Ukraine. These things aren't happening in a vacuum. They are unfolding, especially the last two months once the Russian uh, collapse in the Kharkiv region took place in September. They call it the lightning advance. Uh, when the Ukrainian soldiers quickly took back a huge area, and this set off kind of a domino effect within Russia because up until this September, I think it was 
10th or 12th in that region when they lost that whole area that they thought they had secured. The narrative within Russia, Putin and, and his loyalists were all on the same page. They were, this was a strategic military operation going according to plan. Even they were able to justify, you know, the, the uh, retreat from Kiev in the early days, even inside Russia, that was that was uh, spun as uh, all part of the plan. But when that whole area that they thought they had secured, they lost and lost badly. I mean, they were the the advance was so fast, and the retreat. You know, they left equipment and the soldiers fled in such a fashion that the narrative inside Ukraine began to crack. If you understand Russian. The ethos of the Russian masculine, ultra masculine way of seeing the world. It's, it's just power and victory. And there is no such thing as defeat. You know, that is the worst shameful thing is to actually move backwards. And so some of the jokes were funny on Instagram and different media sources of Russia. They spun that it was a advance in the opposite direction they weren't retreating they were advancing to to uh, prepare for another battle but when that took place uh, you saw those loyalists that were very um, helping Putin kind of keep control of the story they begin to turn and were very upset and very angry and so even in social media and even news the controlled news within Russia began to question what was happening. The change change of leadership needed to take place, with at least within military ranks. And so that began to, I think, create some real issues for Russia, which eventually led to the calling up of these 300,000. Once that took place, when the 300,000 recruits uh, were issued, people started to ask, hey, wait a minute. This is supposed to be just a special military operation to denazify the West and to protect the motherland from NATO influence. Now became questions of, well, what's actually happening inside Ukraine? Why, why do we need 300,000 more troops? Why can't our government take care of that war over there? That was the, up until, you know, September, that was the main thought within Russia in general was this idea that the wars, this special military operation is taking place over there. I can go about my life. Yeah, there's sanctions and whatnot, but it's not really affecting our lives too much. And so kind of stick your head in the sand and move forward because of the uh, controls within Russia. I mean, if you stand up against this war, you are facing some severe consequences. So once they lost the ground, in the Kharkiv region, you saw the domino effects of the 300,000 called up, which then led to a ton of chatter within social media, within Russia, and you in the West probably saw it too, that even the Kremlin says that over 700,000 men have fled Russia since the call up. So you think about it, probably closer to a million have fled Russia, young men, interesting, they kept the borders open. They allowed them to flee. You know, these are those that are not supportive, that don't want to fight. You know, once the war comes home, then you really see your belief system, your what you believe to be worth fighting for. That opened the gates to more questioning. So first the loss of this land, then the call up of these 300,000, which engages moms and grandmas and families, they start seeing their kids taken off to war. Then that led to the 700,000 to a million have fled through Finland, Kazakhstan, Asian, more Eastern Asian uh, countries. And from there, you saw this onslaught of videos surfacing within, again, Russian spaces that Ukraine picks up on and shares of these poorly trained, you know, typically you're called up and you would go through a boot camp and training. Some of these got no training at all. Some of these uh, civilians that had maybe had some military experience, you know, every Russian has to, unless they're medically discharged or have political 
connections. Everyone has to serve at least a couple of years in the military. Once you're done you, the equivalent of high school. So, but these aren't, you know, highly trained soldiers. These are folks that were taken from just regular jobs, conscripted into the Russian army. They went through one week, maybe two weeks of training. You know, many of them were told they had to provide for themselves. So even equipment, safety gear, um, bring your own sleeping bag, you know, heading into the winter, you're seeing on different websites now like selling kit, you know, for the soldier and the Russian families now asking again, like, what is going on? We don't even have enough equipment for our young men. They have to provide their own. So if you you can see the domino effect, the questions starting to arise within Russia, this narrative being questioned, what are we doing? First of all, how come we can't even do this well? And now we're losing ground. And now we're having to send our young men into this supposed, you know, special military operation. So I, I share that because the news focuses on Ukraine, and rightly so, because that's where the suffering and the civilian population now is really beginning to struggle preparing for winter, that inside Russia itself, you have uh, some real tension. I believe in the coming days and weeks that this will become an even greater storyline in the unfolding of this war. And I hope and pray that it's the answer for peace Uh, because as much as we want to see like this (laughs) human victory in terms of humiliation and victory over evil humiliation over these thug oppressive rulers they are being cornered backed into a corner and they have nuclear weapons they have you know the other day uh elon musk posted a, a twitter that got so much negative backlash that do we really want to do this? Do we really want to push a dictator into a corner when he's got his finger on nuclear weaponry? Like how far are we willing to support Ukraine towards a particular kind of victory? And so that's a very contentious question that he posed, but I think that it's one everyone needs to think about. You know, I'm here in Romania, how, how you know, nuclear activity, I'm as close to the Zaporizhia nuclear plant as those in in Kiev. I mean, we're geographically right next to this. And so nuclear fallout uh, just can't be on the table. So what is happening inside of Russia, for me, lies the hope for some sort of revolution. It's the R word that no one will say. Inside Russia, Belarus, that there be some sort of way out of this where the people would rise up and challenge this ridiculous quote operation this war so i was reading this morning how the annexed areas that russia is occupying and they went through their sham quote referendum declaring you know these people are all in favor of joining being part of russia they have now instituted martial law which allows for not just the use of extreme measures of control in these areas, but also opens the gate for martial law within Russia. And so there was an article this morning uh, how Russia is even beginning to react to that because it's a stepping stone for quieting dissent within Russia itself. So interesting to just keep our eyes on what's happening inside of Russia is my point. Because this is not just taking place. The, the battle, yes, the bombs and the drones are, are, are flying around and causing devastation in Ukraine. But there, there's a real battle taking place politically inside of Russia that maybe in the West we don't really understand. And if you follow some of the bloggers or vloggers, those that post videos inside of Russia, it's fascinating Maybe I'll post the link here in this podcast. You can, they're subtitled in English, so you don't have to understand Russian, but they will go around and just interview the average Russian, young, old, male, female, and ask questions like, what do you think is happening in Ukraine? Or should we send our 
our young men into battle and all kinds of different questions and their response and reactions are so telling and interesting. So I think this is the way to get your news now. It's not not your CNNs and Fox News is like those are all, as we know now, just tightly controlled narratives as well. Get it from the horse's mouth. We have technology. We can listen to podcasts. We can go on YouTube and, and listen and watch for ourselves and gather the information. So I encourage you to do that. It really gives you a sense of the pressure and the fear and the power of propaganda uh, inside Russia. And it, I think, opens our eyes to the own, our own propaganda all around us, too. Those in power want to keep it, and they're going to do anything they can to keep it. So I think while we have in the West the opportunity to freely absorb and, and get information ourselves directly from sources, we have to do that. This is how we remain independent thinkers and really bring our, our own selves to this world versus just absorbing and drinking the Kool-Aid, so to say. So in September, when things started to go sideways for Russia and the world began to see like, look, this, this army is not only defeatable, it's, it's in a mess and that there's no will to fight. I mean, soldiers are, the curtain kind of pulled back on, on the reality of the Russian on the ground military situation and the way that they were defeated in Kharkiv and the way the men are fleeing Russia and the way these young men are now being put to the front. They're in the front now. Those that were called up just like six weeks ago are just cannon fodder. And that's helped the world see in the West look and see, wow, on the ground, this is like a paper tiger. This this army is really not what we thought it was. And so that bolstered Ukrainians' confidence. And, and even the West, as we begin to arm them and give even more weapons to, quote, defend themselves, it becomes a slippery slope because now the world sees, and I think even the Kremlin recognizes, it can't win on the ground. So they're now beginning to look to ways to weaken the will of the people. You've seen in the last few weeks through the drones attacks, um, and I'll get to that in just a second, but also looking at the Kherson region, this region down south, um, Putin has to secure for his land bridge to Crimea. When you saw the bridge itself was blown up, well, there's a natural connection from Ukraine into Crimea. So when Crimea was annexed in 2014, they, we, everybody knew like, okay, they want a land bridge. They want to be able to connect from mainland Russia because that controls the so much the flow of industry. Russia has a military naval base in, in Crimea. Uh, the water supply, electricity, all of this was still controlled by Ukraine. So they have had it in their sights for eight years to come at some point, and now we see it unfolding. So they have secured that. But if Kherson fell, this city, this is the only major city that they've taken and held on to, and if it fell to Ukraine, you know, where does that end? And Ukraine plans to take, in their minds, Kherson and then just keep going and even liberate Crimea. So there is a major battle taking place right now in Kherson. I was talking with Alona. She's a young woman, part of our team. Her father, he's in his mid-50s. He's, I think, a sergeant. He is in charge of uh, a group of soldiers. And he has been serving since the beginning of this war. He's now in Belarus, like along the Belarus border, so the northern part of Ukraine. And he's been to the Kherson area, and they kind of shuffle them back and forth. They have to keep... Uh, a contingent along that northern border because the threat of Belarus entering the war and Russia already already has troops all all up in there anyway that they've been doing that for years they continue to rattle their sabers up there and you know make it look like they could come at any time and so that's a realistic issue so the Ukrainian army is forced to keep 
their personnel up there and equipment and, and because there's the thought that they could once the ground freezes right now it's pretty muddy that this winter they could try and take Kiev again so anyway Alona's dad is going to be heading back down to Kherson this area is quote hot they'll say that all the time like how hot is it this is how much action and this is the place right now that the action is focused is the city of Kherson. The fear in this area is that Russia knows it can't keep militarily through just ground battles this city. And what they have done is they began to evacuate last week um, tens of thousands of civilian population from this city. Their goal was to evacuate up to 60,000. And the question is, why? There's the thought that the Kahovka Dam, which is two miles long, it's huge. It provides, it's a hydroelectric dam. It provides up to 30% of Ukraine's electricity. And there have been reports on both sides, the Russians saying that the Ukrainians are planning to blow it up, and the Ukrainian side saying that the Russians are, it's a Russian a controlled area. So, you know, who do you think actually has the capability of blowing it up at the moment? And they uh, have been placing mines, uh, one report says. And so the thought is if this thing was blown up, that it would, again, the weaponization of energy as Ukraine's heading into winter. Not only that, but it would cause just massive casualties in this whole area. It would be flooded. So... There's some interesting history as well, going back to World War II in this area with same same issue with um, blowing up dams. But this would add to the fact that the drones, these Iranian-made drones that have been flying from Crimea and from Belarus and have been uh, bombing strategically, you know, they fly overhead and they bomb these places of infrastructure, so electricity that sustain supports the civilian population and they've been they've been having an effect most of these drones are being shot down many of them have hit and are crippling the country's ability to keep electricity going which is ultimately uh, having a major effect and heading into winter upwards of 20 percent of the current active supply within ukraine has already been taken out and so they're busy trying to fix that but if this dam for example was blown up th that would be over 50 percent of ukraine's power supply at a time when we knew heading into this winter that the weaponization of heat of energy of the ability for a people to stay warm is where this war is headed you know if russia can't win on the battlefield through these you know traditional means then they're going to wreak havoc now with whatever kind of desperate acts they can accomplish so if you've got drones flying over every day uh the sirens going these drones hover over over top for uh, a long time it's and so the air raid sirens people are now having to make a choice, you know, do I spend my whole day in a bunker or in a subway station waiting for the air raid sirens to stop, which could be hours, or do I just make the calculated risk to move forward and live my life? And that's what people are having to adapt in. And so you have in different regions of Ukraine, they're starting to build like these concrete places, you know, on the street, kind of where there's like bus stations, or bus stops where people can crowd under and take safety. Uh, the noise of these drones, uh, people say they sound like uh, like scooters, like mopeds. And once you hear that noise, you head for cover. Yeah, so in the past 10 days alone, there's been over 300 strikes of drone strikes. And the government is now, because of the impact of these strikes upon the infrastructure, they have now come out with a measure to help control the use of electricity. The other day, 1.5 million, just in the Kiev region, people were without power. So if you can imagine in the, the dead of winter, having no power for potentially days or even weeks is going to be catastrophic, especially for the vulnerable, the elderly, 
Um, the government, in preparation for having limited supply of energy, is they have implemented, while we were at this uh, retreat, the graphic came out of how each region will be four hours on, four hours off, four hours on, four hours off throughout the day, and then the next day it rotates. So, for example, you can wake up at 8 o'clock and not have electricity until 12, and then you'll get it from 12 to 4, for example. So, now for businesses another issue too because you think of those that keep products and need to you need you need electricity especially in the service industry they have been asked you know all the malls uh those that have signage out front uh any superfluous energy that's being used like that's unessential for life that they would please at this point they're asking people to just turn it off uh, so mentally, the population is being prepared already for survival mode. So every kilowatt of electricity is being focused towards heat. And this this is such a grief to us because working among widows and villages, they can't go for four hours of no heat in February, you know, when it's minus 20 degrees Celsius, for example. Uh, we know as a family, just living in a smaller town, that the power goes out occasionally through the week. And I know that I've got about an hour in the winter months before my pipes start freezing. So those of you in the West, like you heat through, mostly through convection, through air, you know, hot air. Uh, but in Soviet systems, which I've I haven't quite understood other than it's just maybe the cheapest because uh, they use water. I don't know why they use water, but the, the Slavic heating system within most traditional homes, not I'm not talking about the Western style houses in the cities. I'm talking about the population out in the rural areas. They heat through water boilers. These water boilers called kachols. They are mostly powered by gas, heat up just like a kettle in your kitchen. They heat up the water and they push it through the radiators throughout the house. And most of the older systems, the old Soviet systems, they don't need electricity. They have a pilot light and the electricity can go out and these systems continue to operate as long as there's gas to keep the heat going. But over the past 20, 30 years, people have been buying the combination style kachols where you've got maybe a digital display, a little computer system in there to regulate, you know, your thermostat. And so when your electricity goes out, your system of heat goes down. I had this the first year our family lived in Ukraine. We had this system and the power went out some Big, had a big snowstorm, took down some power lines, our pipes froze, and we were like six weeks. It was a hard winter, and it, we, the weather outside, as long as it stayed below zero, our pipes were not going to melt. So we were freezing. We lived, all of us, in our basement. We also had, once the power came back on, we just used electric heat. So we were the six or seven kids and Deb and I in the basement for weeks just trying to stay warm. We didn't have running water. It was like, what have we done? You know, <laughs> we've moved from the America to here and now we're in a room trying to survive for weeks. And you, you learn quickly that you have to keep water flowing. So whatever the cost, because once your pipes freeze, it's, it's over. So I feel for those heading now into winter with the thought of having these rolling blackouts, essentially, there will be four hours at a time where they're going to hope their pipes don't freeze. And if they do, even when the power comes back on, they're not going to be able to heat their homes. This is going to be an excruciatingly difficult winter and the news I'm afraid, is going to be reporting on things that are too late. So what people are doing, including our own family and ministry and partners, are we're buying as much wood as possible. 
uh, truckloads of wood. We bought a wood splitter the other day just so we can buy it by bulk and cut it quickly, provide for the elderly to have a stockpile to just get through this winter. All eyes are on the winter, um, again, especially for the vulnerable and those that uh, don't have other options. I would guess maybe half of the Ukrainians in the rural communities would have uh, any wood-burning type stove or fireplace. The wood will be, I think, the only source of reliable heat uh, come this December, January. And the forests are already <laughs> purged. Like I live right next to a forest in Ukraine. And even in a normal winter, uh, our neighbors are foraging for any, you know, fallen trees and, and gathering wood. And my friend uh, this week was talking with them and he said he, he's been out there as well. And there's nothing. This is a pretty big forest, but it's all been gathered. There's only the trees that are living remain. So people are preparing the best they can, but this is part of the evil, I think, of this war is that because Russia can't win on the battlefield, they have been planning all along for this winter. I don't think that this is, I think it's coming just in time for them to do a couple things. One, to try and break the will of the people. If there's enough suffering, maybe they'll, you know, look for leadership that will concede. Um, I don't think that's going to work. I think if anything, the attitude towards Russia within Ukraine, any hope of, of Putin thinking that there would be some sort of consolidation um, and brotherhood, it's gone. Right now, the, the hatred is so, is so real inside of Ukraine towards Russia slash you know, oppressive ways of government that no matter what the suffering, no matter how, no matter what the cost, it's just uniting them to defeat this evil. The second thing I think Russia is hoping for is a fracture in the unity among NATO. You're starting to see it, whether it's in Italy, Hungary has traditionally leaned toward the East. And now you're seeing within Germany and a few other Hints this idea that, you know, once suffering hits the populations in Europe, as the Russian gas has been turned off and these countries that are really reliant on Russia, when the people start suffering, there will be a fracture. If they can fracture this pro-Ukrainian support through suffering, uh, and they're banking on it. They've even said in the past, we can suffer better than you can. <laughs> so, and it's true. It's true. There's not even a comparison you turn the heat off in Russia, you turn it off in Finland, not Finland, but maybe like England, and who's going to be the first to throw up the white flag? So the Russia is ready to go through any sanctions. It doesn't matter. They, they take pride in being able to suffer. The West as individualists, because again, we're, we are independent, have it your way consumers, so we're going to, as soon as the suffering hits, we'll see what kind of virtues we have. As soon as our, our gas bill is, you know, three, four, ten times what we thought it was going to be, uh, we'll see what our politicians do and who they support and what kind of peace plan will quickly come together. It's going to be interesting. We have the suffering people in Ukraine giving their lives, the soldiers dying, there's funerals even as we drove back from the Carpathian Mountains back to Romania through a village. You saw the people standing along the road with candles uh, went for about two kilometers. Uh, in every village, every across Ukraine, you have you have the fallen heroes coming back home. These are neighbors, friends, teachers, and they they are in it to quote win it. And what win looks like is another, this is beyond my pay grade in this podcast, but to give you that perspective that they're paying with their lives to stop this aggression, that in the 21st century, you can't just decide that you're going to redraw borders. Um, and all of these countries here that were former Soviet republics are cheering Ukraine on as well and asking, are we next? 
So there's support. There's no question within Ukraine. There is a determination and a support to give everything their very lives and even freeze this winter. And who knows how many will lose their lives to prevent going back to oppressive ways of government. The question is in the West, what kind of political will the, these leaders have and the people that they represent? You know, once we're not giving in the West our lives, you know, we're, we're giving our checkbooks. We're having to buy less at the store because we can't afford what we did two months earlier. And for some of the West, that's maybe a sacrifice that they're not going to be willing to to make. And that's where Putin, I think, is waiting for winter, waiting for suffering both inside Ukraine and in the West for there to be division. And, you know, if you're united and with Ukraine, he, he knows he has to go to other options, which may be nuclear, maybe the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, the biggest nuclear power plant in Europe. He has commandeered he essentially has the workers at gunpoint they if they try to leave this region there is a checkpoint you can leave and go back to ukraine but if you have ever worked at this place you can't go you're escorted back because this they they have weaponized energy both nuclear and now towards the suffering of the people in ukraine and he's hoping that it breaks the will of those in the West to stop supplying these weapons, to stop uh, propping up the army with the tools that are humiliating his army and causing all of this problem inside his own backyard. So that's enough. I think for the news, I, it's so grievous. It's so dynamic. It's, but nothing's happening in a vacuum. You have a former KGB thug leader, with all of his friends who are billionaires who are holding on. It's the king of the hill. You know, we used to play it in Canada at recess time, whoever's at the top. And he's he's going to stay there. He's going to kick anyone down the hill and he'll use all of his weapon weaponry, whatever he can do to maintain power. Same with Lukashenko in Belarus. That guy's a thug as well. He's crafty. He knows how to play the West against the East. Is he going to risk entering the war and to be ostracized from the West even more? I don't think he has anything to lose at this point because he doesn't have any more friends from the West. So very possible that Belarus does enter. I think that's even probable if the unity in the West stays strong. Um, because he'll be, at some point, he has to show Putin that he actually is an asset to him. And they both cover each other's backs, because if you saw a few years ago, the Belarusian people rose up, and they, they tried to, with their vote, show on the streets and with their vote that they are ready for a flourishing, open Slavic future to define who they are as a people and what they value. And they voted for someone else overwhelmingly. And when when Lukashenko uh, refused to acknowledge reality, you saw the real power, the real ugly power when he turned on his own people. And even in Belarus, which could be another podcast because we have friends there, people are being uh, sent to court, imprisoned. One man, a friend of mine was telling me he he has three-year prison term for one text response on social media in support of something. In the West, we have no idea, no idea the kind of fear and pressure and decisions that we need to make when the governing authorities could care less about our life. As long as we go along with the flow, when one yes or one no or one hand raised means you may not see your family again or your child may be taken from you. I have a ton of empathy towards those in both Ukraine and in Russia and in Belarus, because these are people who have been living under uh, constant fear. And we, we in the West, we just go like, why don't you rise up? Why don't you take to the streets? And it's like, you don't understand they have, and they've been beaten. They've been imprisoned. Their family members have been, have been taken away. And those 
that have been escaping, even in Russia. There's those million men that have escaped over the last month from conscription. You know, we can easily point our fingers and say, hey, why aren't you? Well, they have been living under that for years, the same authoritarianism that Ukraine did for years. You know, why did it take Ukraine so long? Why, why did you spend 30 years letting your thugs rule the streets and steal and pillage and kill journalists? There's a, there's a reason why the population is fearful, and we need to pray for them, pray for the people in Russia, pray for those in Belarus that long for the kind of freedom that Ukraine is now fighting for, and Pray for wisdom. Pray for the right time and the right moment. You know, it was a miracle for Ukraine. Saw, you know, during the Sochi Olympics, when all eyes were on Putin, the whole world was watching these Olympics while there was a revolution on the streets that overthrew Putin's puppet, uh, Yanukovych. As that president in Ukraine, we were there as he's fleeing you know, Putin, I don't think he would have ever let that happen if his, if the Olympics weren't taking place and the whole world was, you know, watching. And, and so the little green men entered Crimea. All of that took place. It was just the right time. It was the right moment. And it was allowed to happen. Providentially, we can trust and pray for the right moments. I know it's God's, I'll close with this. I, I, this has been just more information, but my heart is really for this part of the world. There's a deep hunger for freedom. And I'm not talking about a, about a Western capitalism. I'm talking about being able to know who you are as a person and to self-determine, to you know, go after and chase things in your heart that are a reflection of your interests and your dreams and to create culture that in your own family that it is meaningful to you. Like these things are deeply admired and, and are growing in Ukraine and they're still Slavic rooted people. They're not Americans and they have beauty to bring to the world that are, that is inspiring and beautiful. And I'm just ask you to keep Ukraine in your prayers, keep Russia, Belarus, and may the kind of leaders rule that, honor God and, and justice and truth and integrity and value the human individual, um, not just to be a cog in the narrative of the motherland, which is just being abused for the protection of a dictator. So thanks for listening. I know that was a lot of information, maybe not too interesting in all the details, but as you watch the news, as you look towards ways to support and pray. I hope that was helpful to you. Thank you. We'll catch you next week and be back with the parenting podcast.